with changes of the fall, you know, sometimes we see changes in ourselves too. Um, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today with you for myself. Uh, a few weeks ago, <clears throat> probably like four weeks ago or so, I, I came and I did a, uh, a short testimony. What I said was going to be a short testimony, and I had to rush through the third point because I took too long on um, the other points. So to th this morning, what I would like to do um, is finish on that um, third point. And uh, just as a short review, uh, the last time um, I, what I spoke of was our, uh, our need fall back on the powers of the world and how the cross and how Jesus uh, Christ has set us free from that and God set us free from that and last time I spoke heavily about politics um, uh, over the past couple Wednesdays I've talked about the worldly powers as being uh, religion and uh, there was a, a third point um, to what I was talking about uh, and that was nonviolence uh, and so today I want to touch slightly on nonviolence, but nonviolence, uh, which I spoke about the first time, is going to tie into what the third point was um, in my testimony uh, about what I believe um, about the scriptures uh, at this point uh, in my life. And the reason I'm sharing that with everyone is because I want uh, I want to have a, a kind of a basis since. I'm, I have this uh, um, I have this privilege to be able to share with what I learned with folks um, kind of where my mind is uh, in terms of scriptures uh, and hopefully uh, it would maybe shed some light on um, some of the things that I speak about in the future uh, and you know it won't come up every single time that I speak but maybe uh, it might give some idea into, into some of the things I'm looking at. Um, I think that's helpful. You know, when you get a book and you read a book, you read the preface and then you read the introduction. I used to skip all those things. Uh, now I read them and some of the books I read, the preface and the introduction are like a book and I start to get antsy like, let's go. I'm ready. Let's, what's, what's the hold up here? What else do we need to talk about? But they're important things uh, to know. So. Uh, if, if you want to turn uh, in your Bibles, um, I will be reading uh, today uh, largely from my notes uh, with scriptures, but there are a few places that we will go to um, that I don't have copied in. We're going to go to uh, Luke chapter 24, and we're just going to read one verse, and that's 27, which is how we started this um, a few weeks ago. And I know that I've read this uh, scripture several times, or talked about it several times, but... Um, brought to me uh, in some things I've been reading um, by some other men and they use this scripture as a starting place uh, and I think it makes a lot of sense. So we know that in uh, chapter 24 we have the two disciples and they're walking to Emmaus uh, and Jesus comes up alongside them. Of course at this point he is fully Jesus the Messiah um, as uh, the cross work is displayed and uh, he is walking alongside them and they don't recognize him. Uh, and they're talking about everything that's happened, which would be the crucifixion uh, and uh, the cross work. And he has to say to them, don't you recognize me? Don't you know who I am? And then he begins speaking of the scriptures and the way he says it is through speaking of the scriptures. And the scriptures here are the Old Testament. Every time we read scriptures in the New Testament, it is Old Testament. And I think, uh, you know, we tend to read, um, we spend a lot of time in the New Testament, and so that's what we think of as scriptures. And of course, they've become scriptures to us, uh, but to those in Jesus' time, it was the Old Testament. And so everything he says in verse 27, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. So in all of the scriptures, he went through and he told them who he was and how all of the scriptures, all of the Old Testament is pointing to him. Um, 
and pointing to what was about to happen. And uh, that's important to understand because and then you go back and we read the Old Testament, as we're going to see, and we wonder, well, what do we do with the things that don't seem to be pointing to um, the cross? To Jesus, what? How do we read those things? Uh, and that's what's important. Uh, and in the end today, hopefully, that's what I will get to. Um, in John five nineteen, it says, "Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I tell you, the Son can do nothing on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise." So in uh, Jesus' life while he was here uh, among men, um, he did things and said things, and everything that he did and he said, according to this, is what the Father was telling him to do or say. Uh, nothing else. In John chapter 14, verses 6 to 11, we read, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. So again, Jesus is saying something. Everything that I'm doing is the Father. Everything that you see me doing is the Father. Everything you hear me saying is the Father. So when you look at me, you are looking at the Father. You're looking at God. Uh, and it, says at the end, even if you can't believe this, at least believe because of the things that you're seeing, the miracles. At least let that be something to you, because obviously they were having a hard time. Uh, it would probably be hard, right, to be looking at a, a man um, who you lived with every day and shared experiences every day and have him tell you, when you look at me, you see God. And you look at him and you say, no, I look at you and I see a man who is a friend who I spend a lot of time with. Uh, so it was difficult for them. Uh, but Jesus is trying to get that point across. Everything I do, everything I say, um, everything I do and say is of God. I am in God and God is in me. Paul says in 2 Corinthians that God was in Jesus. And what was he doing? was reconciling the world to himself. That's what he was doing. Uh, that's what Jesus was doing on this earth, and that's what God was doing in him. So Jesus said that he is in the Father, and the Father is in me. Uh, we see that also in John chapter 1, where we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. So, the word was God. And the Word was with God. If we read uh, in verse 3, everything that came into being came through through him, what does the Apostle Paul say about that? He says, nothing was made except through Jesus Christ. Everything. Jesus was with God in the beginning. He was not with God in the beginning in the form of the man, Jesus Christ, on this earth, the Son of Man. But he was with God. 
Uh, he was the very words that came out of God's mouth. Um, he was the only begotten. Uh, so God breathed out in those words. Um, if we can imagine it somehow, uh, I try to imagine it to myself, those very words, uh, at some point in God's existence, he breathed it out, and those words became uh, alive. They became a living uh, being who was uh, the Word. And everything that God did happened through that Word. Everything. Uh, creation of every being, everything, this earth, the universe, um, before creation, before us, all of it was through Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's important as we see this, that as we go through this. Um, you know, at one point, uh, I think my dad referred to, um, possibly over the past week or so, but we call this the Word of God, right? That's what people call it. And whatever's in this Word is from God. Um, but according to John chapter 1, this is not the Word of God. The Word of God is the actual words that he spoke, which took on flesh and came and dwelt among us and was the presence of God on this earth. Jesus Christ is the word of God, um, not the scriptures that we hold in front of us. And, uh, you know, this is a tough, tough, tough thing to come to and to try to understand. Um, and hopefully we'll see that this morning, that it was, it was hard. When I first read that, I think the first time I read someone saying that, uh, and then went to someone's podcast and listened to um, a series of things on it, this part of me thought, okay, it was pretty, some, some of it was somewhat easy because I thought, all right, I've already had all these questions for the past couple of years about my Bible, and now I'm reading, hearing something about this, and maybe there's something to this. Um, it's, it's amazing if you, if you come to understand it and see it. Um, in 2 Timothy, and this is what a lot of people will come to, and in fact, if you do a word search for inspired, uh, you won't find it in very many places in the scripture. Um, but it says, every scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the person dedicated to God may be capable and equipped for every good work. So every scripture, that's what this is. We have uh, to Jesus and to Paul, um, these were the Old Testament scripture. And so it was inspired and it was profitable for reproof, correction, and for training in righteousness. As it says, someone might be dedicated to God that they might be equipped for good works, or for every good work. Um, that's what it says this was for. And what is inspiration? When we read, uh, if you look up in Strong's, um, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, uh, in Thayer, it gives a, a definition of inspiration, uh, similar to as in Strong's, but in Thayer, it, it kind of breaks it off a little more. But in Strong's, it, it says, that one of the words that might be the root word can be used for the divine words spoken by God. In fact, the word, uh, the, the phrase scripture is inspired by, or inspired by God is one word, uh, inspired breath of God. Uh, and, and so uh, the idea, I think, when I read that is that we can take this word inspired and take it apart from its everyday meaning. To human beings and say it's no longer inspire it's dictated right and that's how we view inspired but if you read in the ox i use the oxford dictionary because that's the first thing that popped up uh, on google um, inspire does not mean copy word for word uh, it doesn't mean that 
um, Isaiah sat down uh, and started penning out every single word. Uh, and all the words were exactly as the words were uh, that God meant for them to say. Uh, you know, you think about it like this. Uh, I, I, I try to think of an example. I love science fiction. And there is a particular series I read called Wool. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name who wrote it, but uh, it's really good. Um, anyways, the point being that I found all these other things that were related to Wool. And I thought, wow, this guy wrote a lot. But then I started seeing that the author was somebody different. And they call it... Uh, fan novels. So people ran with his story and they, uh, you know, in the story there's all kinds of other things happening that he didn't allude to. So what these fans did was take this and they used the basis of his story to expand it to other places to show, oh well this was what was going on here and this is what was going on there. Um, and I think we read that with a lot of, like Star Wars has that, right? You know, all these different novels written by different people. Um, and I, I thought that was really interesting. So these people were inspired by the original story and the original author to say, I really love that and I, in my imagination this is what is going on over here and it's going to equal what's going on in the original story because they're going to use all the parts. That is what the Oxford Dictionary basically tells us inspire is. Uh, you know, great artists of, of the world were inspired by the artists before them to draw or paint other things. Um, every once in a while one would come up and he would do, he would use that very basis and then expand on it with his own thing and then people were inspired by what he did. Um, this is inspiration. This, this Bible gives us a history of the interactions between men and God. It tells us the story of God creating out of love all the way to redemption out of love of that creation. That's what it is. Um, last week my dad did bring out uh, the book of Enoch, which it's, it's interesting. If you do a, a Google search of the times that Jesus quoted or used things from the book of Enoch, you'll find at least 10 places. And they go to the passage he read, and there might even be quotations, and you won't find those quotations anywhere in what we call the Bible of 66 books we have because they came from uh, extra-biblical works that Jesus and others in his time used. You think of even the Septuagint. The Septuagint was written by Jewish men and it was Hebrew taken into Greek. And that is what was mainly used in the time of Jesus when we talked about scriptures. Um, you know, what was scripture to Paul? And I read, we read Paul, uh, we've spent a lot of time in Paul over the years, and scriptures to Paul weren't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were Isaiah, and Ezekiel, and Lamentations, and Genesis, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, all those, those were his scriptures. So, inspiration, then, uh, is God breathing out to these men to inspire them to write some things that he said and some things tell everyone what our relationship was like. Tell everyone what was the result of them doing things apart from the commandments. Tell everyone these things. Tell everyone what I've been doing for you. Um, tell them this because I want it in, in a written form and I want it to be able to be handed down for thousands and thousands and thousands of years so that people could know who I am uh, and who you were to me and who I was to you uh, and countless other things I'm sure we can get from it. But from the... Uh, we go back before we just started speaking about inspiration, about God being in Jesus. Jesus and God. Uh, you know, I've always wanted to, uh, I read uh, 
or hear about trips to the Holy Land. I always think, well, nowadays it might be kind of scary to go to the Middle East, right? But how cool would it be to be able to walk and go to the places? Um, how cool would it be to go down to the pool where Jesus stood and yelled out, Come to me. It just, because I'm on this earth, and you know, people say, you just get the feeling. Well, of course you do, because you're here, and you're standing like, what if Jesus was standing right here? I mean, that's neat, right? God took the time to say, let me come down to the earth, and let me walk around you, and show, try to show you who I am. He was walking among us. Uh, you know, and that's what Jesus is saying. If you want to know God, then know me. Uh, know me. Because everything about me is who he is. I am his word. And I'm right here. So now you go back in that first imagination of, you know, if, if a cloud or something, and it's his word. And here he is, and he's taken on the form of us, and he's standing on this earth. That is his word. Jesus is the final say. God is the final say through Jesus. And that, of course, uh, eventually culminated on the cross. But I just want to go through a few passages um, and read some things and just... Uh, Kind of maybe put it forth to you as even a question for yourself to look at um, if you think different from me. Uh, and I think probably a lot of people listening or that might listen uh, might think different from me. Um, and so these are just some things, they're just common things that we read every day in the scriptures. And you just wonder. You know, in the past, I've always wondered, or maybe not wondered, in the past, it didn't even occur. Questions wouldn't even occur to me, right? This is the Word of God, the Scripture. If it's in here, that's it. There must be a reason for it, and if I can't understand it, then I just can't understand it. Um, so the first place is in Mark chapter 10. I'm going to read verses uh, 2 through 9. You can turn there if you would like. Remember the Word, Jesus Christ, who is God among us. Emmanuel, God among us, is the final say-so. It says, some Pharisees came, and to test him they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal to and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. You know, when you read that passage, don't you think, I think, of the Apostle Paul, right? He talks about church as a picture, or marriage as a picture of the church. And I think of what he wrote where he says, God's love is so deep, you can't possibly comprehend it. It's so deep, and nothing that God loves, speaking of the believer at that moment, can be separated from God. Nothing. A man and woman get married. Nothing can separate them, according to what Jesus just said. And Jesus is the Word. So then we have the words from the Old Testament that are the Word of God. And now we have the words of the Word of God, according to John chapter 1. I think it's, you know, maybe I'm reaching too far into this, but I read the statement in chapter 3, what did Moses command you? Who commanded them? Did God command them? 
is Jesus saying, or did Moses command them? And then in verse 5 he says, he wrote this commandment for you. He doesn't say God wrote this commandment for you. But we say, well, God gave the commandments to Moses. So we have a couple options to me. Either God didn't tell Moses to say this, and Moses said it because Moses thought, well, they aren't going to listen, and so I'm going to give them something else they can fall back on. Or we have God, in his graciousness, said, you're not going to listen, so let me alter the commandment that I first gave, uh, or that I wanted to give, and make it something that you can live with. Uh, and then Jesus coming back and saying, but no, it was never meant to be that. It was meant to be what I'm telling you. Um, so there's a couple things to think about, to me anyways. Who gave the commandment? I think it's interesting. Who wrote it? Was it God or Moses? Uh, I see that he, I think that Jesus is making a point to say, Moses wrote this commandment for you. He wrote this commandment for you. Uh, I think in these verses, you see a possibility that Jesus is bringing out a point that your scripture that is God-breathed right here is not necessarily a scripture that was God-breathed. It's possible that here we have a scripture that was man-written. Um, I'm not going to tell you either way where you should go with it. I'm just bringing out a couple possibilities. And I think, uh, as Jesus said, everything in the scriptures point to me. If the scriptures were supposed to point to uh, people allowing me to be divorced, and Paul could use the uh, analogy of a man and a woman not being able to be separated as the church or folks in the church and God, um, then we have two different possible pictures. But we're only meant to have one picture. Yes. Pardon? Yeah. What, what Jesus was saying, yeah. Yep. Yep. I think that's what he's trying to say. But this is the word. Right. So, um, in 1 Peter chapter 2.24, this might be early to read this, but uh, it's where I put it in. Um, we read, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we may cease from sinning and live for righteousness. By his wounds you were healed. Uh, in, in a series of books I read by Greg Boyd called The Crucifixion of the Warrior God, he says that God throughout the Old Testament or what other folks have brought out to me are the scriptures, God was constantly stooping down to man and bearing their sins. And so we read of that throughout the Old Testament. When we read someplace where we see this does not, to me, represent the cross. That's a point that we can say, God is inspired men. Here is a story. Here is something that does not seem to equal what the cross is showing us. It's because God is showing a bearing of sins. And at first to me that seemed kind of odd. But then when you see and understand what exactly Jesus did on the cross, it doesn't seem so odd. And others I've read have pointed out that God forgave sins or said he was going to forgive their sins before there was a cross. And so you wonder, well, God's forgiving sins, but the cross is necessary to forgive sins, um, the sins of the world. And so their point being, you take those things and put them together and you see that God was bearing sins of people for the cross. 
But he came. Show us with our own eyes and hear with our own ears and read on pages of something that happened in history, which was the crucifixion, so that we could see it directly. And that is what you are reading when you read things like Mark chapter 10, verses 2 through 9. You're reading something, uh, as my mom just brought out, was given by God, and then Moses came and gave a commandment from God that was the opposite of what God said before. God was showing, I will bear your sin on my shoulders. And so it's written as it was in the Old Testament. And so people from the time that Moses wrote it onwards were divorcing their wives. And they were divorced. That was uh, against what God had intended. It was what men wanted, not what God wanted. And so God there was bearing. Uh, and we read of that uh, in Romans, right? Chapter 1. God let people go to do what they wanted. He let men go to write, I believe, what they wanted. Um, in Ezekiel chapter 36, um, we'll turn over there. As I'm moving along and we have the time to actually turn and read and read through this passage, which has come to me to be very important um, as I read through um, stories and the things and uh, historical things that happened in the Old Testament that seem to be commanded by God, but might seem to be against what I read of God in Jesus. In verse 16, it says, The word of the Lord came to me, mortal, or son of man in some, possibly. When the house of Israel lived on their own soil, they defiled it with their ways and their deeds. Their conduct in my sight was like the uncleanness of a woman in her menstrual period. So I poured out my wrath upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for the idols with which they had defiled it. I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed through the countries in accordance with their conduct and their deeds. I judged them. But when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name, in that it was said of them, These are the people of the Lord, and yet they, go, yet they had to go out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they came. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them, and the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when through you I display my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations, and I will gather you from all the countries, and I will bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you. And you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove from your body the heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, and I will make you follow my statutes, and be careful to observe my ordinances. Uh, we'll stop there. Um, and you can read on, and you can see what God is going to do for them and why he's going to do it. Uh, and the reason is why. Because they profaned his name. Because, uh, as I've heard it said, and I think it's, it makes sense, he took, they took his name, not only when they were in the nations in captivity, but they took his name before that. 
and they basically drug it through the mud and the mire that they had become. Because his name was linked to them. They were linked to him. All of the things they, do, they were doing, all the bloodshed that the ground was crying out, all of the injustice, all of that was profaning his name. Uh, not just to the other nations, but before to the other nations among themselves. And so what did he have to do? Uh, I don't want to be accused of, of going too far out of text or context, but part of me, when I read this, I read what the cross accomplished. He took a people that would believe in his name, and he gives them a spirit, and he puts in their hearts his commandments, and that people is us. In his kingdom and he has made it fruitful and in our consciences and in our minds as we walk in him every day telling us if we're going to listen this is my commandment this is my commandment this is how you live this is how my name is not profaned and he puts a spirit in somebody and that's what he wants uh, and that's what he was looking for from his people Israel to display of him and they didn't do it uh, and when didn't they do it and again I think you if I take this passage and I, I read what it says in, the, in the, the first part that they lived on their own soil and they defiled it with their ways and deeds uh, and it says uh, he's going to pour out his wrath upon them for the blood that they shed upon the land. The whole land that he gave them, the whole promised land, the physical earth that he gave them was taken uh, at great human cost. And when I read that and I see there's blood on the land and the things that they did, I have to wonder, is this just talking about idol worship? and what they did to their own people, injustices, or are we talking about how they lived as people among the nations? Because that's why they had to be uh, taken apart as a nation and spread out uh, because of the things they did. And so I start to wonder, well, what kind of things did they do? Well, so if we turn to Matthew chapter 5, then read verses 43 to 48, we read, you have heard it said, and this is among uh, several verses where you, it says, you have heard it said, uh, but I say, he says, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I have to say that this, this passage, uh, probably more than any of the others, has weighed on my mind a lot. Um, and I hope that came out a little bit when I was talking about politics um, and the wars that politics get us into, right? You know, uh, we have the, the great wars and the wars to end all wars were truly just wars in the middle of all the other wars because wars don't end wars. They just start other wars and other wars, and it just continues. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard people uh, in the media uh, during some of these wars um, on the opposite side of the others, they say things like, you know, oh, in this, if you look at this generation to this generation, or the past, there's been a war every single day. And I think to myself, there's been a war every single day since mankind has started wars. Uh, there might have been more wars in the past 20 years. Um, 
than there might have been in the previous 20 years, but there has been a war every year. Uh, and when I read about loving enemies, I, you know, a lot of people will limit this to loving enemies being the relationship that's closest to you. Um, but I read that my Father in heaven loves his enemies, prays for those who persecute him. Uh, you know, he loves them. And if being perfect is loving my enemies, then how perfect is my Father? And if Jesus is bringing out the differences of what we read in scriptures, which is exactly what he's doing, he's telling them, you have been reading in the scriptures this, I'm telling you, that's not God. But what is he telling them? How can you be perfect as far as enemy love? Uh, I don't... Scroll to the bottom here. Okay, so we have a few minutes. So let's go to a couple of these places. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Now, these are going to be just a few places that we can read. Uh, and, you know, you might say, well, what is your point in reading these? I know someone personally, and I have read of other people, and I told you about uh, Brad Jerzak in his book I read, his latest book I read, where he said that people that he know, knew and went to Bible college with has left faith, they call it, left the faith, uh, or at least put their Bibles aside and said there must be something different. And they did that after reading things. And, you know, we've read these things many times. I've read these things. Actually, we probably haven't read these things many times, but I've read these things uh, enough. Uh, and men will take these things and they'll use it as justification for the things we do, right? Uh, especially recently. Uh, and in any major... Uh, thing that we do militarily, we'll use some of these things. And, you know, we're on the right side, not political right, right being correct. We're on the correct side. Correct side according to what I read in the scriptures. So what we're doing is justified because they are on the wrong side. They believe differently than we do. And very well may be that they are not on the right side of, of God. However, uh, is it our place? In 1 Samuel 15, 3, we read, actually, for, we'll start uh, with verse 2. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish the Amalekites for what they did in opposing the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. Now go ahead and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Now, most of the time, the story is read, and the point is brought out that Saul is rejected because he did not obey God. And that is, uh, it's, it's a great thing to take out of it, right? It's a great lesson. God has commandments. Um, if we don't follow them, it's not going to go well for you, right? It didn't go well for Israel because they didn't follow. Um, but what they didn't follow comes more into question as you think of these things. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, by the way. Uh, having questions about the scriptures and thinking about it and possibly saying, I'm not sure I know where to go with that. But uh, the point I want to bring out when we speak of nonviolence is killing men, women, children, and infants. There are many things that people have to say about this. And you can read many things, and you can decide, well, that's, that's enough for me. But when I read what Jesus just said in Matthew chapter 5, then I have to wonder, is it enough for me? That God just commanded them to go into a land because these people, the Amalekites, when Israel was fleeing Egypt, we're going to go to Psalm 137 next, when he was fleeing Egypt, the Amalekites were 
harassing them and attacking them and robbing from them and yes probably killing or murdering and stealing some of the people and making them slaves because of that you are to wipe out every human being that is an Amalekite utterly and completely off the face of the earth uh, men women children you know often when uh, when we read about the enemy and things of war that they did we often point to all the atrocities against billions which mainly equals older people because they can't fight women and children everybody of fighting age we don't equate with being necessarily a civilian because it's possible that they could fight us uh, and we call it atrocities is it an atrocity was it an atrocity back then people come up with all kinds of things about these all the way down to god was being merciful because they were uh, you know idol worshipers and and the things that they did were terrible so in taking their lives even as infants God was sparing them of the life that they were going to have um, I've read that but I don't you know for a short time that was like okay that makes sense but I don't know if it makes sense so we have Psalms which are songs or prayers out to God desires uh, in Psalm 137, verse, verses 8 and 9, we read, O daughter Babylon, you devastator! Happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. So this person, this psalm, which it doesn't say who it was, who wrote it, but it was a lament over the destruction of Jerusalem, looking for uh, some type of restitution which was going to be according to them they would be really happy to take little ones which equals babies or young uh, children and dashing them against rocks because of what you did to us that's what this verse is saying then you I don't know if you ever stop and think about that um, in the past I haven't I just read straight through it uh, in uh, we'll read uh, one more second Kings chapter 15 and I just have one verse noted in verse 16 it says, at that time, Menahem sacked uh, Tipsa, all who were in it, and its territory from Tirza on, because they did not open it to him. He sacked it. He ripped open all the pregnant women in it. And then we read that if we continue on, that Menahem, Menahem reigns over Israel. This was an Israelite king. Now, he may very well have been an evil Israelite king, but this is what he did. He sacked a city, and it says that he took all the pregnant women, among all the other things I'm sure he did, and took the babies out of them. And we read things like this, and we wonder, were these things of God? Were these things that God had desired for Israel to do? Uh, wiping out entire populations, killing infants and women, uh, taking babies out of pregnant women. Uh, how do you view the verses of the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect as your Father is perfect? How do we view an all-loving God that we teach, one who is merciful and forgiving, who will save all mankind, with the commands that we read about in the Old Testament. You know, we people would say God had power, and he wanted to show that power through his people, and that power was manifested in a human way. But what is power, according to God? What is power? 
It's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. The foolishness of the cross. And through that power, he would save men. That's it. How do we compare all of these passages and many more? Uh, and, you know, in a conversation with my wife recently, I even said, and I know some people will shudder over this, but we hold up the Quran and say it says to behead people and all the other terrible things that it says, and we try to say, look at their religion, because they're still doing that. We're not. But in the history of Christianity, we were doing that. And we try to separate it. I'm not saying I think the Quran is the word of God, because I don't. But I try to look at it now, and I try to do a comparison in my mind. Is what the majority of Christianity believes really so different from what the world believes? And that is my whole point in the powers. The powers. Do we associate ourselves with the powers? Or do we associate ourselves with the word of God who is Jesus? I, I, you know, think about Paul. The life of Paul as Saul. To me, embodies all of what Israel was doing. In the Old Testament. And Jesus came and showed him. This is me. And he looks up and he says, who are you, Lord? Because he got a new spirit. And God said, that's not me. What you're doing is not me. It wasn't me back then, 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. It's not me now. And will never be me. And so when we read through Paul's books and letters, we don't read anything more about driving forcefully over other people for any reason. Paul spends some time in Romans chapter 12 and 13 of explaining why we don't do that and why that is not who God is. That to me is going to typify what we read in Ezekiel about profaning the name of God. So, what is the cross then? The cross, the end point of all of that? Or is the cross the beginning point that we look at everything else? And I think the cross is the beginning point that we look at everything else. I don't think we read of all the things in the Old Testament and think, then God finally came on the cross and put all that to rest so he doesn't have to command those things anymore. I think that the cross is the beginning point. Uh, To me, there has come a point in my life now where there's just not explaining away some things, so it has to be looked at. Some people, and I did a thing about deconstruction a couple years ago, Whatever you might want to call it. You know, some people call it, I'm woke. Which is a weird term to me. (laughs) But whatever it is, reconstruction, it's where I am right now. And so some people say, then why trust anything in here? Right? And that's what some people have said. That's why so many people have, especially young people, have taken the Bible and church and said, nope, I don't want anything to do with it. Because of some of the verses we just read. And they try to take that, and in their minds they can't put it together with what God is saying. So they said, no, that can't be. It's not that they necessarily don't believe in God anymore. It's just that there's something wrong. And I think what's wrong is how we have been looking at this. Maybe some of those things are in there so we can read, after we read what Jesus really is and what God really is, to say, Hey, that's not how we act. Maybe we read that God was gracious in bearing the sins of his people for over, well over a thousand years until the point we read in Ezekiel where he says, you have profaned my name and I'm going to put it right because he was bearing their sins. You can ask my wife. This book is probably the most important book to me in the world because I have many of them. And I just can't stop buying them from different people because I want to see what they have to say about what it says. So what do I do with all those things? 
to me, you know, I don't have all the answers. But if it does not reflect God's ultimate display of power, which is the cross, then I think it should be reconsidered and reexamined from what we have always taught it to be, what has become a tradition. And so for me, it's a new journey uh, in the scriptures. It's what people will say reading the scriptures uh, afresh or freshly. What is it saying? Um, and I think it's important that we look at it that way. Uh, and so I will leave it there. Um, and hopefully um, those couple short testimonies or a couple hours worth of testimony will give you some idea of where my mind is um, as I go forward in things.